welcome to this special 75th lecture. Um, I am very pleased that you decided to spend your time with us here this afternoon. I know there are many other things you could have chosen to do, but we really appreciate it. And we also really appreciate our guest lecturer and the person who will be delivering that lecture, Emeritus Professor Paul Rees. Now, I personally had the pleasure of working with Professor Rees for a period of about four years or so. And it really and truly was quite a pleasure. The, the professor and the man is quite a, a pleasant, very calm, always composed gentleman. And it was truly um, interesting and a learning experience to have spent that time with Professor Rees. But that was a fairly short period of time that I worked with Professor Rees. And there is a lady here who I know has worked with him for a much longer period of time and can tell you a lot more about Professor Rees. I'm sure as well, not just on the professional side of things, but on a more personal side of things. It's also always a pleasure to hear this lady speak. And that I'm referring to is none other than Dr. Donna Minot Cates, who I'd like to invite now to give us an introduction and tell us a little bit more about our guest speaker this afternoon, Professor Reese. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Donna Minot Cates. Thank you, Dr. Busby Earl. Dean, associate deans, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, and a very special welcome as I look in the audience to Mrs. Fiona Simpson and Reverend Marlon Simpson, family of Professor Rees. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I have been asked to introduce my esteemed colleague, Professor Emeritus Paul Rees. It is becoming somewhat of a habit because many years ago when he was elevated to the rank of professor and I was then a mere pleb, my friend asked me if I could introduce him when he was directed to deliver his inaugural professorial lecture. It was an honor then, and it remains an honor today. And so here I am once again. Paul, no more lectures. I'm not introducing you again. Professor Reese's outstanding career as a scientist was set in motion when, as a young boy, he traded in a defective train set received as a Christmas present for a chemistry set. You can see it's been a long road. The rest, as they say, is history. Paul went on to excel in chemistry with the tutelage of his Kingston College teacher, mentor, and later lifelong friend, Mrs. Irene Moore, who not only provided a thorough foundation in chemistry, but introduce topics then beyond the syllabus, including approaching organic chemistry from a mechanistic point of view, then unheard of at the high school level. He went on to the University of the West Indies, graduating with honors in chemistry and biochemistry, and journeyed thereafter to the land of his birth and embarked on a PhD program at the University of Sussex under the supervision of internationally renowned chemist, Professor James Hamilton. While at Sussex, he also had the pleasure of benefiting from the impactful insights of Nobel laureate, Professor John Cornforth. Paul graduated in 1984 with a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Organic Chemistry 
and ventured forth to the prairies of Canada to take up a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Alberta. This would mark the beginning of an enduring collaboration with his then supervisor, Professor John Vedderus, and Paul's lifelong research in biocatalysis. Paul Rees returned home to the UWI as a lecturer in organic chemistry and launched a vibrant research program in natural products and the fungal transformation of steroids. He has successfully supervised 15 PhD and three Master of Philosophy candidates to date, as well as co-supervised many more. And although retired, he continues to supervise graduate students. Throughout the years, his research work has yielded over 60 journal articles, three book chapters, numerous, numerous conference presentations, as well as three international patents, undergirded by significant grant funding. A recipient of numerous awards, including the Principal's Award for, quite a few, Best Researcher, Best Research Publication, Research Project with the Greatest Business Economic Development Impact, and the Minister's Innovation Award. These significant accomplishments charted his career from lecturer to senior lecturer and eventually professor of bioorganic chemistry. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, a member of several other professional societies, including the American Chemical Society and the Caribbean Academy of Sciences. On his retirement, these many accomplishments afforded in part the basis for the conferment of the title Emeritus Professor. Paul Rees has served the UWI with distinction in various roles, including that of Head of the Department of Chemistry, Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology, and Chairman of the Committee of Deans. He is the current organizing secretary for the MONA Symposium in Natural Products and Medicinal Chemistry. It is the longest running conference of its kind in the region, having been started in 1966. He has provided invaluable service to several private and public entities, too numerous to mention, so I don't have to go through them here. But I must indicate that he's a former vice president of the West Indies Group of University Teachers, Wigert, Jamaica. Paul is a resourceful, consistent, diplomatic, confidential, humble man. A family-oriented individual. He does everything with his family in mind and likewise, and I again acknowledge Fiona and Marla. A man who bleeds and sees purple everywhere, he shares his wealth of knowledge, not just in chemistry, but whatever he has garnered over the years, he shares liberally, and all who can who have interacted with him can attest to that fact. Today, in this very special 75th anniversary lecture, help me to welcome my colleague and friend, Emeritus Professor Paul Rees, who will speak to us on harvesting a selection of the fruits of nature, isolation of a range of natural products. Professor Emeritus, Paul Rees.
All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, you got the long title from my colleague. Uh, and thank you very much, Donna, for your introduction. You're always very kind at hiding my imperfections. Uh, but first of all, of course, I'd like to thank the faculty for inviting me to speak on some of the research that we've carried out over the years. And I recognize that I'm speaking to a mixed audience. So I will attempt to interweave the chemistry with some more general information. But the non-chemists, please bear with me. Chemists live for structures. And so you're going to see many structures. But I hope that the narrative that goes along with them will uh, help you through it. Right, now I would like to say that when I started my project, uh, this is what I had in mind. Uh, that's not quite so. But some of these were my research objectives. And uh, generally, you know, my aims were for discovery and, of course, for training my students. And uh, when I say, in the second one, explore the chemistry of such compounds, what I'm talking about is chemical con uh, conversions, because nature gives us many compounds, but as chemists, we have the tools uh, in which we can convert them to others, uh, sometimes compounds that are new. I have, going down the list, uh, prepare students to function internationally, and above that, train Caribbean individuals in modern techniques of investigation. But I have to say that uh, learning occurred on both sides. Your supervisors, you sometimes go in thinking you, you have it down, you've done all the reading and all of that, uh, but chemistry or science will often surprise you. Right. This is the area in which we have pursued our research. It's the interface between biology and organic chemistry. And my initial research plan on coming to Mono was, let me look for natural products from local plants and fungi as well. There was very little work done on fungal metabolites here, a lot on natural products going all the way back to the beginning of the department. And here I've just shown you two plants uh, I chose them because they're quite colorful. Uh, two plants that we worked with. And um, the one on the left is called Calcio, sorry, Calciolaria, Chelidonioides, and the one on the right is Salvia coccinea. And also two fungi. Uh, I've got them growing on petri dishes, and I've also shown some pictures uh, of what they look like under the microscope. Almost every photo you'll see today has been taken from the web. Uh, the photos on the web are so much better than the ones that I have uh, had. All right, and the fungi on the right, uh, the top one is um, Aspergillus niger, and the one at the bottom is Pacillomyces varioti. Okay, disclaimer. You might see this at the end of a paper, but this is at the beginning of the talk. I am not a natural product chemist, although we work with natural products. Nor am I an ethnobotanist, nor a herbalist. So I am not in a position to recommend herbal products to anyone. All right, so starting with natural products from flowering plants, uh, this was something that was almost a no-brainer. The department had a history of looking at natural products from more flowering plants, and in Jamaica we have quite a wide range. Uh, what I have on the slide are some examples of important plants. Uh, the one on the left, I'm really just showing the leaves, but it's from the bark of the willow that we isolate an aspirin precursor, and this was discovered you know, many, many years ago, that if you took the extract from the bark, uh, then it could lower your fever or uh, take care of your headache. Uh, the one in the middle is the opium poppy. And um, after the flower has faded, uh, you'll see that there is, can I turn this on? Uh, there is a pod. Uh, and if you cut the pod with a sharp knife, a latex 
uh, will run out. And in that latex, uh, it's called opium, and most of that is morphine. And morphine is one of the most wonderful painkillers in the world. Having had surgery and been on morphine, I attest to its value. And I didn't feel great when they stopped giving it to me. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's the Pacific U, Y-E-W, uh, from which we get Taxol. And um, that is uh, a compound which is um, being used more and more in various types of cancer. Uh, too many to mention here. Uh, the problem is uh, also with, with um, Taxol, it's taken from the bark of the tree. And once you take the bark off the tree, the tree is dead. And so but what has been found is that in the leaves, there is a precursor to Taxol. And so chemists can take the leaves, extract this, this compound, which is, has a very long name, 10 the acetyl bacotin 3 uh, and you can chemically convert that compound to Taxol. So it's made by semi-synthesis. And so I want to indicate to you that it is important to isolate compounds uh, from nature, but also be prepared to do some chemistry to convert them into the products that you want. Also, it is at the moment, it is not sustainable to isolate the natural products that we need for our medicines and agriculture uh, from, from plants, because we just would not be able to grow sufficient plant material to produce enough. So we have to depend on synthesis. I should also indicate to you, because this is a common question to me, uh, how many drugs do you have on the market? Let me give you some data. Uh, of 5,000 compounds that enter preclinical testing, only five go on to human trials. And of those five, only one gets to the market. On average, it takes about 12 years, and it costs one billion US dollars. So, Taking stuff to the market is done by pharmaceutical companies, but we can certainly provide leads uh, for this. Okay, I've got a captive audience online and here. Organic chemistry lesson number one. Uh, what we have here on the left-hand side is a model of a molecule, caffeine, and we, I've um, got the atoms color-coded, so the black circles represent carbon atoms, uh, the blue ones, and I hope the colors came through here, yes, they did, okay, the blue ones represent nitrogens, the red ones, oxygens, and the white ones, hydrogens. And then what we have on the right-hand side is the chemist's shortcut for drawing these sorts of molecules. So the N represents nitrogen, the O represents oxygen, uh, and where you see the various angles and the sticks, they represent carbon atoms with their relevant hydrogens on there. And it's much simpler to draw the structure on the right uh, than the one on the left when we're communicating with each other. And so all the structures that follow from this will look like the one on the right. I will not have colored the oxygens red and the nitrogens blue, but sometimes I have colored the atoms because I, I want to bring something to your attention. Okay, where do we get caffeine? Well, you know, cola drinks, tea, coffee, uh, and the energy drinks. And you know what happens uh, when you drink caffeine, particularly too much. And that leads me to the first plant that we looked at. You may recognize it, maybe not the name, but this is busy, uh, well-steeped in Jamaican folklore. Uh, the nuts are used to make a beverage, uh, which is a stimulant, and is supposed to be, at least in Jamaican folklore, an antidote to poison. Caffeine and other alkaloids, including theobromine, have been isolated from the nuts. However, my um, initial approach to this plant uh, was a little different. Uh, my my brother-in-law had told me that it was well known that the latex that oozes from the cut stem of this plant when you put it in water is used 
as eye drops uh, for your inflamed eyes. And um, his parents had a farm near Chapleton in Clarendon, and so I got free plant material there, collected it, uh, started work on the extract uh, from the leaves and stems. And uh, in a short while, I took on my first graduate student, Maureen Wilson, I passed it on to her. I have to admit reluctantly, because at that point I only trusted myself. But fortunately, she taught me uh, to trust students. Um, all right, and she isolated a number of compounds, and there are four of them on the slide. Uh, I've highlighted Teraxerol. In 2013, so 10 years ago, Chinese researchers reported that that compound, they isolated it from another plant, uh, is anti-inflammatory. So it does tell me that there is probably something to the Jamaican folklore on this plant. This is John Charles, used to be known as Hyptis verticillata, now Condair verticillata. Botanists are always updating names. It's an aromatic herb, and the teas are used to treat coughs and colds. Uh, my second student, Roy Porter, was always very interested in plants that were containing what we call essential oils. So these are the plants, you know, like mint, etc., that when you take the leaf and you crush it and you smell it, it, it has... Uh, an oil which is volatile and it has uh, some sort of smell. So he got me to start looking at that. This was one of my early nasty shocks. While he was working on it, he isolated a number of compounds, anti-cancer compounds, etc. Um, most of them were known, but not all. And all of a sudden, Two papers appeared from work done in Mexico, Mexican and German investigators. And um, in the one on the right, you, you can see that the Mije indigenous people in Oaxaca in Mexico um, use this plant in traditional medicine. Where they live uh, is latitude 17 degrees, and we are latitude 18 degrees. I, I had an opportunity to, um, to go to a conference in Mexico, and I was in that region, Yucatan region, and uh, I was very, very much surprised at how similar the plants were. So it shouldn't be a shock that two different groups were working on the plant at the same time as us, and they isolated many of the compounds that we did. So, was this a disaster? Well, initially, yes, of course. Uh, however, the method that um, they used is the traditional one. They took the green plant material, they chopped it, uh, oven dried it, milled it to a powder, and extracted it with a solvent. And we had done that initially, but when Roy had um, put the green plant material in the oven and then checked it a day later to turn it over to make sure it dried evenly, he and another graduate student who was with him were overcome by a very, very pungent odor that was being given off by the plant. And so he suggested to me that maybe we should extract the green plant and find out uh, what is in the green plant which is lost when it's dried in the oven. And I suppose that was where Dr. Porter, as he is now, started his interest in essential oils, because now he's on staff, that is exactly what he looks at, essential oils from plants. Right, so I was wise enough to listen to him. And we extracted the green plant material and evaporated the solvent, and we found two compounds, which are shown on the slide, which had not been found by our Mexican colleagues, I'm happy to say. Neither of them was novel, but the one on the left had been isolated in really very, very tiny amounts. The one on the right had been found in a plant in Australia uh, many, many years ago and nowhere else. The plant is traditionally used in the Americas to repel lice 
and lice are insects, and it's to repel lice in hens' nests. So they would put the plant material in the hens' nests to keep the lice away from the, uh, the, the hens. Okay, so we decided to investigate the one on the left, which was plentiful uh, against the insect. Uh, something interesting about the one on the right is that it, the one on the left is found just about everywhere in Jamaica. The compound on the left is found when the plant is grown, say, in the Hope River Valley. But when the plant is grown in St. Catherine, and I mean just where the highway starts, it only produces the one on the left. So, as far as I can tell, the plant is genetically the same. It's just that, depending on where it's growing, it may produce different compounds. And I'm going to come to that again during this talk. Right, so as I said, we wanted to look at the one on the left and compare its biological activity. Uh, and so, I needed a collaborator, and at the time, in the Department of Life Sciences, there was Dr. Lawrence Williams, and he was looking at insect pests, and this is one, Silas, which is the sweet potato weevil, and he painstakingly did the bioassays. I don't do any bioassays. Uh, he painstakingly did the bioassays, and that compound that I showed you on the slide uh, was very toxic, killed 90% of the insects at uh, a level of 3.6 milligrams per gram of insect. And this was after 48 hours. Uh, what I've got on the right-hand side is just to show you the inside of a sweet potato uh, which has been um, infested with um, the larvae of the sweet potato weevil. Right, but he wasn't satisfied with that. He also wanted to look at an acarid and so this is the southern cattle tick. And um, there's a blow up of, of that. Uh, there's also a poor cow that is really uh, infested with it. Uh, hopefully this photograph was taken just before they removed the ticks. And um, so what he did was he tried uh, this compound with it and he was very disappointed to inform me that it was non-toxic to, to the tick. Now, as far as I was concerned, it's no problem. We've already found activity. So, uh, if it doesn't kill the, the tick, then fine. We just won't mention it. However, uh, he was very, very driven. And uh, what he looked at was he followed the ticks uh, that had been uh, dosed with this compound. Uh, and you'll see in the lower right-hand photograph uh, that these ticks produce lots and lots of eggs. And he noticed that when they had been treated with this compound, they produced just about half the normal amount of eggs. He continued to follow it through. Many of the eggs did not hatch. And in those that hatched, the larvae that came out were malformed or deformed. And after a lot of work, what he recognized was that what this compound appears to do is when the mother tick is um, generating, I don't know if that's the right word, the, the eggs inside her body, uh, you have to pass a certain amount of fat uh, into the eggs so that the developing larvae has enough to live on. And this seems to interfere with that. So I mean, the term we use as scientists is that it interferes with lipid translocation, but basically it apparently stops the fat being moved to the eggs. So the developing larvae don't have enough nutrients to live on, and so they're born uh, malformed or they're not born at all. All right, moving on to another plant. Uh, this one grows wild in parts of St. Thomas. I'm not aware of any medicinal use, Uh, the student who looked at this was Dwight Collins, and he isolated a number of compounds. They're fairly similar. You can tell from the shapes of, of the molecules, even if you're not a chemist. Uh, these are called sembranes, and sembranes generally possess anti-cancer activity, and this was no exception. Uh, these compounds were all new. Goatweed 
is given that name because it's consumed by goats. It also grows in St. Thomas, and it's been used across the Caribbean for many ailments. Uh, Winklet Gallimore was my student, and she isolated the first compound there uh, before she left to do postdoc. Uh, that was Caprylide A. Dwight Collins, who followed her, isolated Caprylides B, C, and D. And for the chemists who are among us, you may notice that there are just very subtle differences in these compounds. One is the stereochemistry of the methyl groups on the five-membered ring, and the other one is the stereochemistry where the five-membered ring lactone meets the six-membered ring. Uh, sorry, non-chemists. But uh, the, the point I'm making here is, in theory, these compounds could have been artifacts. In other words, only one of them might have been isolated from nature. And when we were carrying out our manipulations, uh, purifying them on a column and all of that, they could possibly have rearranged. There are chemical ways in which they could have rearranged. They're from caprylide A to B, C, and D. However, we have done some tests, uh, and we are sure that all four are natural products. You may recognize this plant. Uh, certainly, in, um, it's growing all over as an ornamental uh, around the edges of various properties, uh, particularly in St. Andrew. It's called the firecracker plant abroad. Uh, it produces a number of compounds. I've only shown three here that are closely related. The first one that I've labeled lupin-1, lupiol, is very, very common in plants, but the other two are not. And uh, the, the third compound, which I would say would be probably boring to non-chemists and maybe most organic chemists as well, uh, when it was published, that paper has garnered the, the most... Um, citations uh, because there's some very interesting, not biological activity, but structural activity of lupine 3 uh, This work was done by Greg Buchanan. Stemodium maritima. Anybody who's heard a talk given by my students uh, has heard of Stemodium maritima. They think that all my students have worked on this plant. Uh, they're not too far from the truth. Um, but this plant grows you're widespread in Jamaica, especially in saline soils. The tea is used for stomach ache. The compound on the left, stemodin, is antiviral and cytotoxic. And that's what we learned because it had been isolated before. But when we started working on it, we've also found that it, in, it inhibits the growth of tumor cells, not just any cell. And we've got some work from Michigan State University which shows that certain gastric, lung, breast, colon, and central nervous system cancer cells. Uh, their, their growth is reduced uh, when we have the compound at concentrations of 25 micrograms per mil. Right, so this compound has been fully exploited by members of our group. More on this later. Uh, I have Glenroy Martin and Maureen Wilson there because they were the initial students who worked on it, but there's a much longer list. Right, now somebody once said that natural product work is stamp collecting. So I could have spent the hour going through and saying, and we got this from this compound, this plant and that plant. Uh, here are four more plants that we studied as well, and the students who worked on them. Uh, the only thing I'd want to point out here is with the one on the right, Salvia coccinea. This plant had been studied before, in, and the others hadn't, uh, in India and Italy. And what we found out was that the compounds that were produced in Jamaica were completely different from the ones that had been found in Italy and in India. You always hear about uh, how great Jamaican ginger is. Also Blue Mountain coffee. Why is it Blue Mountain coffee if it is grown in a certain region of the Blue Mountain and not the same as lowland coffee? The compounds that are produced in the various microclimates of Jamaica are different. So the point here is that we have done our collections. Uh, for instance, the salvia, we um, isolated um, compounds from it. It was up in Blue Mountains. The Caparis peruginea was from Long Mountain. The Modi durantifolia was in Augustown and Calciolaria. Caledonioides was um, somewhere near Newcastle. But 
depending on where they're growing, you might get different compounds. All right. As far as plants are concerned, I'm going to say finally, uh, this is spirit weed. Uh, Dr. Busby Earl is from Trinidad. He may recognize this. Uh, Trinidadians use this in their cooking and all of that. As a matter of fact, I went to a conference in Trinidad some time ago, and uh, when I went to, I was hungry, I went to Subway, and I told them that I wanted a certain dressing, and they were trying to push the spirit weed dressing because it's that important uh, to, to them. All right, but um, this came out of a fruitful collaboration uh, between colleagues in chemistry, of course, and the Department of Life Sciences. Uh, what they did, and this was uh, initially the work of uh, Professor Ralph Robinson, what they did was the student, Wayne Forbes, screened 25 plants that were traditionally used in treating worms and screen them for activity against a certain parasitic roundworm, which I'll mention on the next slide. The compound that's on the right-hand side of the slide, Eryngeal, emerged the winner. Uh, so that came from this plant, which was the best, and then this compound was isolated. And that's where uh, the chemists came in, because we had to isolate, and isolate the compound. Uh, Professor Robinson was the first researcher to develop a method for growing this parasite, uh, this roundworm, in culture in the lab. And so we had a, a way of, of screening compounds against this parasite. The parasite is called Strongyloides tercoralis, and it is prevalent in the tropics. It usually lives in the gut of humans and other mammals where it really doesn't cause much harm. But if your immune system breaks down, then dissemination occurs. In other words, the worm leaves the intestine, goes into the bloodstream, and can end up anywhere, in including the, the brain. And uh, so that could be a, a serious problem. So this was... Um, this compound was very active. I didn't, I forgot to mention, it was more active than anything on the market. And uh, I've also collaborated with uh, Professor Lisa Lindo and her students, Tamika Barkley and Denise Daly, and uh, Dr. Paul Singh, the student Ahmed Khan from the Department of Basic Medical Sciences. And I just want to point out that this can be very useful for a chemist because two of our three international patents have come out of collaborations with colleagues in other departments. So only one is homegrown. Okay, I started by saying we wanted to look at natural products from plants and from fungi. And I have a question mark there. So it meant there were some challenges. There are many examples of useful fungal products. However, uh, when we started looking at them, whether mushrooms or even the microfungi, we were very, very disappointed. We got ergosterol, which is a steroid present in every uh, fungus, and we also got fats, lipids. So, what I decided to do was maybe we need to put the fungal natural products on the back burner for the time being. But I was very, very unhappy about doing that. Uh, fortunately, Maureen Wilson, my first student, distracted me by suggesting that we try something that she called biocatalysis, something that she had read in a, in a journal article. Well, I ignored her for a while, but she persisted. And I, I read some of the papers, and after an initial reluctance, I decided to take it on. All right, so what is biocatalysis? All right, before I go there, I, I want to give you lesson number two. I've got um, some steroids here. Top left-hand corner, uh, this is actually testosterone, one of the hormones of maleness. And on the right-hand side, I have got something that it has been converted to. So the arrow between the left compound and the right compound means that the one on the left was changed to the one on the right. 
And what is different about the one on the right? I mean, they look very similar. It's got four rings, etc. But notice, I've highlighted it in blue, that the five-membered ring has an oxygen which has a double bond to the ring. Uh, the other thing I want to point out in the one below is that there are two arrows between the compounds. And what that means is that the compound on the left is converted to the compound on the right, but it will be more than one step. It could be two, three, four, or many steps. The other thing in green, I've got a formula and two words. Uh, these are the chemicals that are needed to convert the compound on the left to the one on the right. Right, I call this hope deferred because I really wanted to use the fungi to find natural products. But uh, let's look at fungal transformation of steroids because that was what was in the paper. I'm going to start by a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, the compound at the top left, stigmasterol, is present in just about all plants. Very cheap, common steroid. And by a number of chemical steps, see the two arrows? A number of chemical steps, it's converted to progesterone, which is a female hormone. And then the hope was to convert it to 11-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone, and then by some chemical steps to cortisone. Now, cortisone is uh, an anti-inflammatory steroid. Uh, we don't hear a lot about it. When we think of steroids, we think of something else. I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, but it was very important uh, that we have this compound because, as I said, it was anti-inflammatory and it was extremely expensive. Only the rich could, could get it. But the problem was, and I'm that arrow, um, the arrow after progesterone to, to 11 alpha hydroxyprogesterone, uh, overcoming that hurdle was uh, extremely difficult. There was some pioneering, pioneering work at the Upjohn Company 70 years ago uh, in which they treated a fungus that was growing in liquid medium, like a chemical reagent. So what they did was they grew the fungus in you know, what we call a nutrient broth containing carbohydrates, proteins, minerals, etc. And while the fungus was growing, they added the compound, the progesterone, to it. And several days later, they found that the progesterone had been converted to 11-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone. So, once they had overcome this, they were able to make cortisone in 11 steps from the cheap stigmasterol compared with 37, which is what they had had to do before. And there was a reduction in the costs. Uh, the cost was reduced to 1%, not by 1%, to 1%. And that meant that cortisone was available for everyone. And a number of... Um, Cortisone analogs are used nowadays. If you get a cut, um, they'll give you an antifungal agent, but there will be a steroid in there to reduce inflammation. Right, this is what people think of when they hear the word steroids. Of course, steroids are used in bodybuilding, uh, illegally, of course. Uh, and yeah, even poor Charlie Brown's not having much success, and maybe he, he's thinking that a dose of steroid might help him. But steroids are more than just used in bodybuilding. They're, of course, androgenic and estrogenic. They make us you know, who we are, males, females. But they're anti-inflammatory. I've mentioned that as well. They control the mineral balance in our bodies. They regulate blood pressure. And some synthetic steroids serve as contraceptives, and others alleviate menstrual disorders. Right, so we decided that we would carry out some of these reactions ourselves. So we started using locally isolated fungi. So progesterone was converted to this compound on the right. Uh, the new atoms on there are colored in blue. And this work was done by Maureen Wilson. The fungus, Fusermoxysporum vacubens, was isolated by my colleague, Professor Phyllis Coates-Beckford of the Department of Life Sciences. 
who to this day remains my advisor in mycology, even though she retired more than 10 years ago. Uh, the fungus below, Exophiala, the carne corny, was isolated by Dr. Edwin Mohammed from an infected plant. He was doing plant tissue culture and this was a pain in the neck because it infected his, uh, his plant material. But for me, it was something I could start working with and Roy Porter worked with this fungus. Okay, here are seven fungi that we worked with. Um, the first one, DHEA, testosterone, they're male steroid hormones. Uh, progesterone below, pregnenolone, and estrone at the bottom are all female hormones, and cortisone and prednisone um, reduce inflammation. So we have these seven steroids, all with biological activity. We had access to about 50 strains, 50 fungal strains. Uh, 30 of them were locally isolated, and about 20 were accessed internationally. I'll go into that afterwards. And so I could have spent the rest of my career doing this. But you can see that quite a number of students uh, worked on these projects. Okay, where there was a real challenge though, was using fungi to convert compounds we call terpenes. That's a more recent phenomenon. And the local strains usually just don't make the grade. Uh, so what we did was we purchased 20 fungi with a history of converting terpenes to new analogs. And that's what I call stacking the deck. I always tell my students, if we can look, if we can find an advantage in moving forward, then let's take it. All right, what are terpenes? Well, you come across them in daily life, but you just don't know that they're terpenes. They're certainly present in many fruits and flowers and all of that. Uh, the terpenes with smaller numbers uh, are volatile, and so they give fruits and flowers their, their smell. So I have uh, some citrus there, and they contain limonene. Uh, that's mostly present in the, in the rind. Uh, and below that, I've got mint, which uh, produces menthol. But there are other terpenes which don't necessarily have a smell, but they're very useful in agriculture or medicine. Uh, the top right-hand side, I've got Artemisia annua, which is sweet wormwood, grows in Europe, and it yields artemisinin, which is one of the best antimalarial compounds in the world. And, and many of the terpenes, as I said, are useful in medicine and agriculture. Uh, below that I have tomatoes. Tomatoes contain a red pigment called lycopene, and many of the colored compounds, not the green ones, uh, but you know, the purples and the oranges, etc., are terpenes, those that are in fruits and vegetables. Right, you saw this plot before, John Charles, and I mentioned that there were two compounds that were isolated from it, and both of these are terpenes. They belong to the terpene family. The one on the left was the one that was active against the sweet potato weevil. So, I had a new student, and we tried many, many different ways of feeding the compound to the growing fungus to get products. Uh, the fungus there in green is Bovira bassiana, and I chose that one because it was the one that had the greatest history of transforming terpenes. As I said, I always want to stack the deck in my favor. And we worked on this for about a year. Nothing. But one day, success. And uh, success in abundance. Because the starting material, labeled one, is on the left. And he fed it to the fungus under certain conditions. And he got nine different products. One go. Not only that, there was what we call proof of concept. Compounds three, five, and seven were more active than compound one. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for natural products that have biological activity and finding ways of making analogs that may have even more activity. 
Right, now most of these reactions were what we call reduction or hydroxylation. But these fungi are able to do all sorts of other things. For example, they can carry out reactions which end up with carbon-carbon bond cleavage. And here is uh, a compound that was isolated by Andrew Lamb with this fungus, Phenerichy chrysosporium, and Kian McCook fed a stemodane and ended up with a rearranged compound where the five-membered ring became a six-membered ring and a methyl group migrated. This was, is, is certainly not very common. Right, so here are some examples of terpenes that we have looked at. Um, we've fed them. I said we have about 20 fungi that transform terpenes, and we've got all sorts of um, products. The third compound and the seventh compound are not natural products. They are products that, have, that we have essentially made in the lab. Um, and you can see a large number of students, one postdoc, uh, worked uh, on this. Uh, the person I'd want to highlight in the middle of the list at the bottom, Jessica Shiverton de Grasse, the one with the longest name. Uh, Jessica was an undergraduate student, who was here from Nevis. And she spent it somewhere in the group and um, you know, really did some very good work. So these were not all... Uh, graduate students, but nearly everything was. Right. After success, you start taking risks. And we wanted to try something different. We wanted to see if we could treat fungi even more like chemical reagents. And so what we did was we took fungi, broke them into fragments, and put them in an inert binder. So we had round beads containing fungal cells. Because I wanted to see if we could use these beads to carry out the reactions, just like growing fungi. And there are reasons for doing this. I was told by the experts that it would not work. They said, don't waste your time. The fungi are not going to survive. And if by some fluke, they survive. They're certainly not going to carry out the reactions that you want. Now, if that's what happened, I would not be mentioning this now. So, um, there was uh, some success. So, what I've got on the right-hand side are two sets of beads. I've colored the fungi blue and red, you know, just to show that they were different. Um, and so, I would take, for instance, the bead with fungus A, many of the beads, put them in a flask, uh, with some water and add, add my compounds and shake them for uh, five days. And then at the end of the five days, we'd have the compounds that we want. The compound that we fed was changed into something else, just like with the fermentation flask. But the difference is that these were much cleaner because when the fungus is growing, fungi are making natural products and all sorts of other things. But when you have them in the beads, they're generally... Uh, I would say for the most part, are not making natural products. So you feed your compound, they, they're just like factories, they take your compound, convert it to something else, and chuck them out of the beads. So it's very easy to isolate them. So we call them clean fermentations. Oh, and another advantage is that the, the beads are reusable. So we can use them for a fermentation, take out the compound that we've got, the new compound, and then we can use them again. Right, but... Once we realized this worked, uh, we had another idea. What about if we put two different types of beads? In other words, a bead with fungus A and a bead with fungus B in a flask. And, and so we'd have half of the beads were blue and half of them were red. I mean, the way that I've put them here. And in theory, what could happen is a compound, which I've called zero, compound zero could go into the blue bead where a chemical reaction would occur, and then it would be excreted out back into the medium, uh, compound one, that's what we performed. Compound one could then go into the red bead and be converted to compound two. So, but, but also, 
suppose compound zero entered the red bead first, then it could make a different compound, which is com compound three, and that would be excreted into the medium, and then if compound three is taken up by the blue bead, it could make compound four. So if you have two types of beads, and each type of bead makes one compound, then you have the potential of having four products in one flask. And this is what we would call crossover. Okay, but what would happen if each fungus generated two products? Then you can see at the end of the day, we could have 12 products. And what if we had three fungi or four fungi? Uh, essentially, what we could do would be build up what we call a library of compounds. But that's in theory. All right. Of course, we tried it. Uh, so we've got the compound in the sort of orange box. Um, and when we mixed it with beads containing the fungus mucor plumbeus, we got two compounds. And they are essentially very boring compounds. They're very, very similar to each other. What's worse is when we use Cunningham Elekinolata of our elegans, we got two compounds as well, but one of them was the same as one in the other. This is the same as that. So, that was not very interesting at all. So, but the question was, all right, despite the disappointing results, what about if we mix the two sets of beads together and add th that compound? Well, again, uh, success. Uh, the, the compound in the box is what we fed. The three compounds beside it, to the right of it, are the compounds we got when we used one fungus or the other. But when we mixed the two together, we not only got the three compounds at the top, but we got eight more as well. And many of them were, were new. And as I said, this is called developing or generating a library of compounds. Uh, in my light moments, we call it combinatorial biocatalysis. And we um, have patented it, uh, US and uh, European Union uh, as well. And so, the early work was done by Avril Chen uh, towards the end of her PhD, and um, it was really followed up by Patrice Peart. So Avril worked out the conditions, and uh, Patrice uh, isolated all the compounds. Okay. Um, so we have looked at a range as I said, of steroids and terpenes that, that have been subjected to this novel technique. And so uh, I'd indicated to Patrice Peart a while ago, uh, Jordan McKenzie has followed up, followed up on her work where we have transformed a number of steroids. Uh, Avril Chen did very, very early preliminary work again uh, with terpenes, but this was followed up in large part by Mark Collins. So we can use the beads to make analogs of steroids and of terpenes. Okay. During my PhD studies, I looked at chemical transformation of steroids. So you're just doing reactions in the lab, no fungi involved. And uh, some of my students have followed up on, on this. Uh, and I've just given some examples, uh, just structures, strange structures of compounds. Uh, these are all steroids, but they are very different from the ones that you would come across. I mean, the first one has a mercury incorporated. We have one with palladium uh, as well. You know, others with bromine and various sized rings, etc. Peter Roddick and Tony Johnson did this and generated a number of unique steroids. And a new friend, that would be chemical transformation of terpenes, and I've only got one terpene here in the box, and it's stemodin, 
antiviral, anti-cancer, and uh, we have made a number of analogs. Here, we're just showing 15, but we have made many, many more. I think we probably have about 30 or more analogs uh, of this. And um, the analogs here are all similar to each other. I've just highlighted the differences in blue or green. And not only have we made these compounds synthetically, but we have uh, fed them to fungi and made new analogs. So you know, the story can go on forever. Uh, many of these compounds have bioactivity, anti-cancer, uh, your colon, breast, prostate. Um, some of them affect inflammation and pain. And we are doing some current work with Drs. Dwight Robinson and Michelle Emanuel of the Department of Life Sciences uh, looking at bioassays for activity that would be related to agriculture. Uh, I would want to point out one name here, uh, and that's Dwayne Thompson. He was an undergraduate student as well who worked on a project and isolated some, uh, sorry, synthesized some very interesting compounds. Finally, natural products from fungi. Right, why are we interested in this? I mean, this has been the elephant in the room. I kept talking about natural products from fungi in the beginning. Um, over this long career, we've been trying to find ways of inducing fungi to generate natural products, uh, mainly by modifying their growing conditions, as they call it, um, medium engineering. Uh, why are people interested in fungi? Right, here are three examples. Penicillium is the one that everybody knows about. It makes penicillin, which is an antibacterial compound. Uh, you may not be familiar with uh, Claviceps purpurea. It's ergot. It grows on barley. And that those blackened areas are the infected areas of the crop. Um, and it generates something called ergotamine. And ergotamine uh, constricts blood vessels. In other words, uh, blood vessels can expand or contract, it makes them contract. And this is important, uh, for instance, if you suffer from migraine, uh, you can take ergotamine and it will relieve the migraine. You don't take it for too long, because if it constricts your blood vessels for a very long time, eventually the blood flow to your fingers, etc., uh, is cut off and you end up losing your fingers. Right? And, and also, uh, the final one uh, generates cyclosporin. Cyclosporin suppresses the immune system. So if you have an organ transplant, you're going to be on cyclosporin uh, probably for the rest of your life. So these are very, very important compounds. Right. But uh, this took a strange turn. Uh, one of my students, uh, former students, came back as a staff member, Winklet Gallimore, and her work has been in marine chemistry. And she was always going out collecting various specimens, and one day I asked her if my student, Denton Ferron, and I could accompany her, and you know, she'd go along, this is off the coast of Port Royal, and she'd say, oh, this looks like an interesting sponge, and I'd say, oh, yes, this looks like an interesting sponge. So everything she collected, I collected. And uh, we brought them back to the lab, and uh, I've, I have uh, two marine algae on the left-hand side and two sponges on the right-hand side uh, that were among the 18 or so that we had collected. We looked inside them, and I'm not going to go through any details on how we did that, uh, and we were able to isolate about 20 different fungi. And they've all been identified. Uh, here are just four of them growing on, on plates here. And they were identified by morphology, you know, the shape of their spores under the microscope, as well as in some cases it was a bit more difficult, so nucleic acid sequencing was done. Uh, not by us. So, we grew them up, and we found that by using certain media, we were able to get them to produce natural products. Uh, I have some names here, Audio Barnett and Ken McCook actually worked with um, terrestrial fungi, but Denton Ferron, Anira Sherrington, Mark Collins worked with marine fungi and have isolated some of the compounds shown on this slide. 
as well. But as I said, we had to do something called medium engineering, you know, using specific nutrients and often solid substrates. Now, as I move towards the end, because uh, I see I've gone more than an hour already, we're just going to change gears and I won't deter you too much longer. Now, we've got a lot of work, a lot of results. When I look at this slide, the first thing that comes to my mind is, uh, what if you clone your graduate students? <laughs> then maybe you can double the amount. Uh, no, uh, I, I'm not actually into this. Uh, what I wanted to show you is I've got some sets of identical twins, and the poor parents on the, of, of the kids on the right have two sets of twins and two sets of twin boys. Double trouble. Right, why are twins identical in physical features? They are because they have identical DNA. And DNA, as you know, is a blueprint that determines our biological and chemical makeup. Twins on the left are the twins on the right. They are Japanese identical twins on the right. Uh, the photograph was taken when they were 107. Uh, they're still alive, by the way. Um, when I checked on the web, they are 109 years and 200 days old. Okay. You can see on the left-hand side that you know, they're identical. A little bit of difference. The one on the left is starting to go gray. Uh, but there are more differences. And it's not just because of the clothes they're wearing or one is wearing glasses. There are some differences. After 100 years, there are differences. Question is why? Well, people will always tell you, oh, it's the environment. You know, the story of nature versus nurture. But what is the mechanism by which this occurs? Well, I can talk about one of them. But before that, Let's forget humans and look at rats. These two mice, sorry, they're not rats. These two mice are called agouti mice. It may surprise you to know that they are identical genetically. The one on the right is the normal one. Something happened to the one on the left. Now, I said these are twins, so they had the embryos, and they were twins. One was implanted into uh, the, the mother, and the one on the right was born. The other one was implanted in the, in the mother, but during her pregnancy, they fed her a very, very high calorie diet. And so the mouse on the left when it was born, it was obese and remained obese and was diabetic. What was different? They were twins, same mother, just the conditions during pregnancy. Okay? And there are parallels with humans as well. You know, twins that are reared in completely different circumstances sometimes do not resemble each other as much as twins who have stayed together. So the lesson here is some of your genes were switched on or off even when you were in your mother's womb. Okay, biochemistry. Uh, what we've got at the bottom is a chromosome and then as we zoom all the way up to the top what we're doing is using uh, higher and higher power um, mic uh, microscope uh, to see what is in there, unraveling the complexity. Uh, because DNA is very, very tightly wound in cells. And about halfway up the slide, you'll see some round circles with the DNA wrapped around it very tightly. And then, as you go all the way up to the top, you see the, the DNA spiral that you're used to seeing. Okay. Now, in our body, the DNA is tightly wrapped around these round things, which we call uh, histones. And what does DNA do? 
how does DNA determine what we look like? Um, DNA is a blueprint for the proteins that we make in our body, and some of the proteins are structural, but other proteins are what we call enzymes, they're catalysts that carry out reactions. And some genes are turned on and some are turned off in different cells. Uh, you would have heard about stem cells, but most of the cells, almost all the cells in, in the body, are differentiated cells. So a liver cell will do one thing, but uh, a heart cell will do something else. And they are identically the same genetically, but certain genes are turned off in heart cells and turned on in liver cells and vice versa. So turning on and off genes actually has some relevance for what we were interested in. So what I have here is, uh, this is called the nucleosome, where I have the DNA, which is wrapped very tightly uh, around the histones. And since the DNA is tightly wrapped around the histones, it's not available to be used as a blueprint to make the, the enzymes that we're interested in. But if they can be released, and there are chemicals that will do this, then you can see in the bottom uh, picture that the DNA, parts of the DNA are accessible, and once they're accessible, then they can be used as a blueprint to, to make certain proteins and all of that. Right, now these compounds are quite expensive to purchase, but fortunately some of them have found use in cancer and so they're available. And so what we have done is we have grown fermentations and we've added some of these compounds, they're called epigenetic modifiers, along with some others, uh, some ideas that I had had, and we have found that even though the work is very, very challenging, that we have been able to induce the fungi to produce new compounds. Okay, what have we learned? When you are going to do a project, don't focus too closely on anything. Have a broad plan. I talked about stacking the deck in your favor. Make sure that the conditions are favorable for you. You are going to have surprises. Things never go according to plan, and when you have a surprise, embrace it. If you don't listen to your students, you will miss out on some goodies. Be positive, and no matter what happens, keep pressing on. Acknowledgements, at last. Right, who are the ones who did the work? Well, here are some of them. I mentioned their work along with the slides. It was never my intention to set up a matchmaking service. However, Avril Chen and Dwight Collins met in my group and uh, now they are the happy parents of four children, uh, one of which is just graduating from our department in chemistry this year. Um, and Kayanne McCook and Floyd Russell uh, also did the same about 10 years later. Uh, their daughter is a little too young to come to UA, but I suppose there's still hope. Another set. And these are the ones who haven't escaped yet. But they are working their way towards completion. Continuing. Uh, my mentors, um, you would have heard from Donna, Irene Mork, who 
was an amazing chemistry teacher. Now she's a very successful author in Canada. Uh, Dr. Earl Roberts kept me on the straight and narrow path when I first came to UWE uh, in terms of organic chemistry and also was a mentor when I came to UWE as a staff member. I carried out my PhD work, and as you've heard, with Jim Hansen at Sussex and was influenced very much by Sir John Cornforth, who didn't do any teaching and was in the lab quite a lot. And sometimes when I had challenges, I would go and talk to him and he'd point me in the right direction. I, I postdoc in Alberta, which is actually on fire right now, uh, with John Vedderus. That's where I started fungal work. And uh, during my career, I did some work with Bert Holland, who taught me uh, many, many things about biocatalysis. I've collaborated with Bill Reynolds at Toronto. He ran many of our early NMR experiments before we had the facilities we have now. Morally Nair did many of the bioassays. David Williams carried out X-ray analysis on some of our compounds when we couldn't work out what the structures were. Uh, Rufka Delgoda at NPI is our current collaborator for anti-cancer tests. Marcus Durant uh, was our, the person who worked with us on determining the three-dimensional structure of the enzymes, and now we're working with Dr. Peter Nelson, who's in the department. Of course, I had to be, we had to be funded, and you can see where we've got our money there. Um, I want to also acknowledge technical support for this talk by graduate students Marcel Denny and Ricardo Price, as well as Garfield Williams, who brought an extra Apple Mac along, just in case there were problems. Many well-wishers took the time to send supportive messages, and these are very much appreciated. Uh, Co-workers and friends in chemistry and the wider UA community, especially Donna Minot, uh, Yvette Jackson, uh, have been very helpful, very supportive during my career. Also, my Wigert colleagues, who helped to make my tenure at UA a rewarding one. My immediate and extended family members, especially Fiona, Marlon, who I was told are here, and Micah, uh, for their love and support, putting up with my very, very long hours at work. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge my late parents, who shared my vision and supported me as I pursued my dream. This presentation is dedicated to my family. Advertisement. As Donna said, since 1966, every two years, we've had our Natural Products Symposium, except 2022 because of COVID. Uh, the next meeting is in January, will be our 29th meeting. And so I hope that some of you will be interested in attending. And I appreciate your presence here and online. Thank you very, very much, Professor Rees. And that was a very interesting presentation, I must say. I, I would also like to point out that, I think I've said this before, one of the joys of living in the Caribbean is the many words that we have for many of the same things. So what you refer to as spirit weed prof in Trinidad, I am going to guess that they call it by another name. Anybody here knows cilantro and likes it? Right, but it's called Shadow Benny in Trinidad. Right, so hearing spirit weed now as another name, I mean, across the islands, there are so many things that we call the same plant or fruit or so on. It's really a wonderful thing to live here in the Caribbean. Any questions before we bring this very interesting session to a close? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Professor Rees. I quite enjoyed your presentation. I wanted to actually uh, find out uh, 
I will say some of the information you gave me. I didn't read up on that earlier. The issue of bio transformation. I, it's quite, kind of quite of a war we have in the medical sciences. Uh, many of my colleagues do not actually agree that this natural product has any efficacy. And I quite, uh, I see you started by having a disclaimer. You don't want to be a herbalist or naturally or even a natural product uh, enthusiast. But here you are mentioning something about biotransformation. And we actually see that that could be one of the major reasons why we see plants or natural products having different effects on different persons. I mean, take for example, we know that the simplest enzyme like alcohol dehydrogenase is present in some persons and not present in others. I mean, people can drink alcohol and get stoned and some other individuals can drink cartons of it and they're okay. And if that is of course the case, uh, I see that you're using fungi in a petri dish. Is there any how we can think about this kind of customized medication where we can think about looking at those enzymes that are present or absent in humans, why they may be reacting to a particular kind of chemical and not reacting to others? That's just some point I want to think about. Um, um, the other thing, again, is, of course, you talked about variations, geographical variations. I didn't know if you actually checked for seasonal variations because I, I didn't hear about that. But I know that sometimes uh, plants collected in the summer versus in the winter, they have different composition. And then back to publications. I had had issues with looking at a lot of publications, especially the ones on meta-analysis, where somebody aggregates Let's say somebody looks at ginger and aggregates all the data on ginger as uh, how they affect, let's say, cancer. Uh, it tells you it worked in India, it worked in Africa, it did not work. And these are, of course, based on percentages of what has already been reported. Now, so I want to ask you, because I know you're a very, very good reviewer of articles. When you see this meta-analysis, what do you feel about them? Because if we have these seasonal variations, and we have these geographical variations in the composition of these plant products, and somebody kind of, kind of aggregates all this data coming from these different individuals and tells us it's not working, and of course, further accentuating many of the medics' uh, view about this natural product not being effective, uh, don't you think that something should be done about that? I mean, and then, of course, the last question. Sorry, I have so many questions. I'm trying to push everyone at now. Um, you talked about a lot of things about pushing the boundaries of science. I mean, uh, when you tried one fungi and then you decided to try two fungi at the same time, I have had uh, some mishap. Sometimes when you try something or a new methodology in research and some reviewer tells you you are very unscientific, kind of demoralizing you. So what do you tell individuals who may want to push these brand boundaries or frontiers of science, especially with regards to the methodology, in making sure that people out there are able to appreciate that you can try things that have never been tried to be able to come to some very, very reasonable, um, maybe something reasonable, let me put it that way. Well, that's a tall order. Um, I hope I've... There, there, there is a lot in there. Uh, let me just answer various aspects of it. Uh, one of the things with um, our biotransformations is we have been very careful to use a specific strain. Uh, so even if we've isolated the strain here, we've made sure that it's been identified uh, elsewhere and it is in their herbarium. So anybody who wants to repeat our work or, or test our work uh, can, can use that. Now, the, you talked about the enzymes. Um, some of the enzymes uh, could be isolated, but a lot of the reactions that we were looking at are carried out by what we call cytochrome P450 enzymes. They're the ones that put on the hydroxyl groups on our molecules. And we put on hydroxyl groups because they become more water soluble and sometimes that gives them better biological activity. And we've actually shown that that has been the case. But these enzymes are, are not free. They're not floating around in the cytosol. They're, they are actually membrane bound. And if you remove them from the membrane, uh, that then they denature and so they don't work. And so that has been our excuse 
for using whole organisms. But, but yes, there, you, we certainly could isolate uh, various enzymes. Uh, yeah, you talked about um, geographical variability. Yeah, we found that to be a real pain. So we have been, we're not right down to GPS uh, monitoring now, but we certainly go back to the same place to collect the plant material. Um, you know, if we want to collect the same metabolites. And yes, there is seasonal variation. Uh, we certainly learned that you don't go after rainfall because if you do, all you'll get is lipids. Uh, the plants need to be stressed. Uh, your drought is actually the best time to go. And also, uh, when Roy Porter was my graduate student, uh, with that, that same plant, Hyptis verticillata, Condé verticillata, John Charles, uh, he found that there were two what we call triterpenes that were produced, ursolic acid and oleonic acid, and their concentrations varied depending on the time of the year. And we were very lucky. I mentioned Jessica Shiverton de Grasse from uh, Nevis. Uh, she actually did some isolations at the right time of the year based on some of the information we had from him, and we were able to isolate one of the two. And the reason why I mention it is it's almost impossible to separate them. Uh, by chromatography. But if you catch them at the right time of the year, you can get the one you want. Uh, publishing. Wow. Yes. First of all, if Jamaica is at the end of your address and your reviewer is, let's say, in the developed world, let me not call any countries, in the developed world, then you can sometimes have problems you almost have to prove yourself, overprove yourself, uh, by making sure your work is, is very good and fits into their standards. Yes, I've received questions that didn't make any sense at all. Um, and I thought that I was being insulted, but I, you continue to be polite and answer them. Um, when you do something that is, oh, and I've also asked editors not to allow certain people to be reviewers of my paper because I continued the work of someone in the southern United States and I don't know for whatever reason uh, my work was never good enough but once I had asked for him not to be used uh, there was no problem there and um, yes uh, innovative stuff yeah, with the beads, <laughs> that was a challenge. I tried three journals, and with the third one, I waited six months, and I heard nothing. I, so I wrote the editor, I didn't get a response. Uh, a year afterwards, he responded, uh, not, not a year after my letter, a year after submission of the paper, he, he responded and he said, this is a new technique, I can't find anybody who wants to review it. Would you want to withdraw it? And I said no. And about six or seven weeks after that, uh, I, I got reports uh, and the paper was accepted. And of course, once you've got the first one in that uh, method accepted, then the way is clear to get the others. So it, it has been uh, quite an uphill battle. And I talked about, uh, in one of my slides, about a positive attitude, but you have to keep going. I will add that the first paper that I submitted when I came here was the first thing that they said was make about 20 or 30 different corrections. I made them dutifully. And then the paper was rejected. And one of the reviewers said, and, and I, I see my former student right here. Uh, Peter, you don't mind if I say that you were the student. My, my first paper here. Yeah, the author, sorry, the reviewer said that this work was um, a report on a dead-end project. Now, as a new staff member, I mean, that was crushing. But you sleep on it, days pass, 
You come in, the students are still in the lab, and you soldier on. Right. I think, oh, oh, sorry. And in terms of, yeah, this is the last thing. I don't see any reason why, and, and Professor Phyllis Coates Beckford mentioned this to me, and also Professor Azimoto. We grow our fungi in tubes on potato, dextrose, agar. They will grow very happily on yam, dextrose, agar as well. And uh, we, we should push that as well as an alternative because we can easily, well, potatoes, Irish potatoes, as we say here, uh, are, are more expensive. We maybe should be growing our fungi on indigenous uh, materials rather than imported ones. Thank you very much, Prof. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I won't keep you much longer. I know we've gone over time a bit. So I'd like to begin to wrap up. And I'd first like to say thanks again to Professor Reese. Uh, one of the things that I had come to understand and know, and it's obviously um, very much a characteristic of Professor Reese, is he's always very open and very willing to, to share his experiences in his career, both the ups and downs, and his pioneering work. So thank you very much, Prof. Reese. It's always a pleasure. I'd also like to thank Dr. Minot Cates for her introduction and for all of that information that she, that she shared about Prof. Reese. It's also very interesting to hear and to learn about the non-professional um, aspects of Professor Reese's and any of us, most of us, our, our lives. So thank you very much, Dr. Minot Cates. And ladies and gentlemen, we have some light refreshment outside, also kindly provided by the Department of Chemistry. And so we're very grateful for that. And of course, for the time that you spent here with us this afternoon, both here physically and online, we are very grateful and we hope that you find it was time well spent as much as we here also did. Thank you very much. We will have one other uh, special 75th anniversary lecture. It's scheduled for later this year in September and I look forward to seeing you all then. I will let you know who it is as, as time proceeds. Sorry, Auntie Terry, what am I forgetting? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to those two. We, we, we have a few coming. One of them is actually here with us, right? Hmm? Yeah, th there will be inaugural lectures as well to come. Um, so I'd also finally like to thank, as she is still here, Mrs. Collins Free and Mrs. Greensmith for all of their work in getting everything together for this afternoon. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have a pleasant evening. See you again soon.